documentary about one of Ireland's most terrifying ghost stories now, the devil comes calling to Loftus Hall with horrifying consequences. This programme is not suitable for children. eastern seaboard of Ireland, a tiny peninsula brazenly reaches into treacherous waters. An area often referred to by the old sailors as the graveyard of a thousand ships. A calm sea here is just a temporary departure from the evil side of nature. In the past, countless mariners cursed this place with their dying breath. This is the story of an ageless, all-powerful dark being who came ashore here bearing a gift evil in every form. By hook or by crook, it was Oliver Cromwell who coined the expression, and about 800 years ago, a Norman invader, Raymond Le Gros, built this tower to prevent ships foundering and proudly show the entrance to Waterford Harbour. Hook Lighthouse is actually the oldest lighthouse in Europe. So ferocious are the seas in this region that this rock was washed up one stormy November night in the 1940s. Its estimated weight about 50 tons. The medieval church of Saint Saviour stands on the site of an early monastic settlement, and in fact it's here that our story begins. 1,500 years ago, a monk from Wales named Duvon, who was later styled a saint, chose this hallowed site for his followers. Its bleak setting, a perfect place for monks who sought a life far from worldly care and temptation. It appears Saint Duvon concerned himself with saving lives as much as he did with saving souls. To prove it, he lit the first beacon where Hoop Lighthouse now stands. His followers maintained it for centuries. Ironically, it was the beacon lit by Saint Duvon which more than a thousand years later guided a mysterious ship to the safety of Slade Harbour. The ship's sole passenger would make his way to Loftus Hall. The story of the mysterious stranger saved by the light of a saint is intertwined in the multi-layered history of Loftus Hall. Just a mile from Hoop Lighthouse, the hall rises defiantly from its dark, simple surroundings. Even before the hall was built, this site witnessed savage brutality and murder. If a land can hold the secrets of its past, then the land around Loftus Hall could tell much of evil and troubled forces. On May Day in the year 1170, just three miles from Loftus Hall, 3,000 local men were butchered here by invading Norman soldiers. One Norman warlord awarded himself the lands hereabout and then quickly established his feudal estate. His name being Alexander Fitzredmond, he named his estate Redmond Hall. For 500 years, he and his descendants enjoyed the privileges of the ruling class, until the arrival of the Lord Protector, Oliver Cromwell. The hall was attacked twice during the Cromwellian campaign, in 1642 and again in 1649. Old Nicholas Redmond defended the hall well against tremendous odds. Redmond hung wool sacks on the windows of the hall, most of the musket balls were caught in these and then fired back at the attackers. An ingenious ploy that worked well and is venerated for posterity in the Redmond coat of arms. Old Nicholas Redmond eventually surrendered to Cromwell, but on his own terms. In 
His surrender, nonetheless, meant forfeiture. The act of settlement following the Cromwellian campaign awarded the house and lands to Sir Nicholas Loftus in the year 1666. The parties and social gatherings attracted lots of visitors here in the past, and although the furnishings these days are less impressive, Loftus Hall does have one very decorative boast, its staircase. When the house was being rebuilt in the 1870s, the fourth Marquess of Eli commissioned this stairway as a centerpiece and talking point. He also hoped his opulence would suitably impress a daughter of Queen Victoria, whom he wished to marry. The stairs took nine years to carve in Italy and three years to assemble here in the main hall. Today, it's considered priceless. Everywhere you look here, you find remnants of a time that was. An old coach house, now roofless, no doubt remembers better times. Through this gun port, you could have shot any number of deer, specially bred for the purpose. A paradox of sport, really. Although a house has stood here for 900 years, Loftus Hall gives all the appearances of having arrived yesterday. There's an uneasy excitement about the sprawling mansion. Revealing few of its foreboding secrets, the massive structure in chiseled stone speaks in echoes. Since the Norman incursion long ago, architecturally, Loftus Hall has worn many mantles. During the 18th century, it was an austere, decaying, ivy-clad building with no pretensions to beauty or grandeur in its grim interior. Its attractions for the visitor in wintertime were few, and yet, in the year 1765, Sir Charles Tottenham came here on a Christmas visit, accompanying him, his second wife, and his daughter Anne. The guest's only amusement was a card game, hosted by a much inebriated Baron Loftus. For Anne, it was a predictable, innocuous ritual. Life at the hall was dull enough for a young lady, but this was intolerable. Anne longed for some romantic intrusion to pass away the lingering hours. One dreadfully stormy night, a servant entered announcing that a young gentleman on horseback was at the outer gate and was seeking admission, explaining that the captain of a boat on which he had been the only passenger had been forced to tie up due to the ferocity of the elements at Slade Harbour, just a mile from the hall. Rain sodden and frozen, he had managed to hire a horse from a local farmer, and being a stranger to the locality, the lights of the hall had guided him here. My lord, may I present our guest? Tottenham obviously felt some compassion for the young man's situation and with gentlemanly hospitality instructed the butler to present him to the company. You're welcome, sir. My host, Baron Loftus. Baroness, our guest. My wife, Anne. And, of course, my daughter. Charles, having given the traditional welcome afforded to travellers, invited the young man to stay for some days at the hall. The visitor, having impeccable manners and appearing above all else well-bred, endeared himself to everybody. Especially to Anne, her yearnings for romance were becoming a reality. The nightly game of cards continued. Anne partook of the game partnered by the visitor. Together, they were winning every hand. Anne seemed obsessed, even intoxicated, by her partner's presence. Needless to say, her antics didn't go unnoticed. One night, startled by the striking clock, Anne dropped some cards.
stranger had vanished. A putrid, stinking smell was all that remained in his wake. It said that the hole which appeared in the ceiling resisted all attempts at repair until the house was rebuilt in the 1870s. Anne would never recover. Still in shock, she was carried to a room in the house known as the tapestry room. Her health deteriorated physically and mentally. Tradition says that each evening a maid helped Anne to change into the dress she had worn on that fateful night. Anne suffered desperate unhappiness and loneliness. Her only memory was for the stranger. She resolved to sit in the tapestry room window waiting for the return of her unrequited love. However, this is not the way Anne died. It's a romantic version that seems to pander to the Victorian passion for poetic idealism. The truth of Anne's disappearance reveals a tale of terrifying ignorance and cruelty. The varying accounts of her diminishing health are probably accurate. Hovering on insanity, Anne proved an embarrassment to the family image. Like a forgotten doll, she was hidden away from prying eyes in an unused part of the mansion. Here, it was easy to deny she ever existed. Denied love and understanding, she became impossible. Her convulsions and incessant pitiful cries for help made her prison even smaller. of savage mistreatment, death must have been a welcome release. Her broken, mangled body could no longer be touched by pain. Tottenham's birth and death are well documented, but the whereabouts of Anne's gravesite remained a mystery until a chance discovery just 50 years ago. There are no records in existence now concerning which Tottenham family members are contained in this vault. However, in the 1940s, the door to the vault was vandalized. Workmen were engaged to carry out the necessary repairs and to seal the vault permanently. Workmen claimed they saw a strange coffin, one that was different to all the rest in this crypt. Its lid sloped upwards, almost as though the body shape required special attention by the coffin maker. And this gives us a clue. 
Anne was only 28 years old when she died. But she was almost a cripple. Sitting in the same position for 10 years, her leg joints had become locked into position. Safe then to assume that this is Anne's final resting place. If Anne's emaciated remains rested in a cold vault and feathered on sea, her troubled spirit didn't. Nightly, her ghostly apparition glided through the dim halls and passageways of the old house. No one felt safe as she appeared and disappeared anywhere from the scullery or gun room to the banqueting hall and stables. As dawn approached, she vanished into the tapestry room, remaining there until she emerged again the following night. The hauntings caused chaos. Terrified staff refusing to work after dark seemed to welcome the threat of dismissal. Anne was avenging herself well. Then, matters became worse with the stranger's return. At night, the thundering sound of a horse circling the house increased the anguish and sleeplessness of everyone. Loftusall had indeed become an ungodly place. In 18th century Ireland, the constant war of intolerance between Protestants and Catholics lay somewhere between contempt and hatred. The punishment for unregistered priests was branding and castration. It's inconceivable that a staunch Protestant family like Loftus would find deliverance through a Catholic priest. Father Thomas Brodus was a man of God who saw the ugliness in bigotry and found it as bitter as sin itself. As parish priest of the then impoverished Hook area, he must have felt some surprise when he read the letter from his bishop. After much consideration, I have no reason to doubt the Tottenham story, as it is now rife amongst the congregation. By God's mercy and your faith, I urge you to proceed with haste to Loftus Hall and rid the family of that which disturbs them there by exorcism. God bless you, Tom. Slates are falling all day, Father. And not a wisp of wind. Where are the other witnesses, Michael? Well, if they were coming, they'd be here by now, Father.
I exorcise thee, most vile spirit, the very embodiment of our enemy, the entire spectre, the whole legion in the name of Jesus Christ, and to get out and flee. O oh, most dire one, give place. Give place, thou most impious. Give place to Christ, in whom thou hast found nothing of thy work, who hath despoiled thee, who hath destroyed thy kingdom, who hath led thee captive and hath plundered thy goods, who hath cast thee into outer darkness. Let me come. Uh, Therefore, now in his name, be proud. It is hard to keep the wish to resist. But the more slowly thou go out, the more punishment against thee increases. He is a God who condemned thee in Judas Iscariot. Nonetheless, the sinner, do not think, do not think, be content. Father Brodus continued with his exorcism for several days and nights. He banished the stranger from the hall forever and managed to confine Anne Tottenham's ghost to the infamous tapestry room. Father Brodus is well remembered by the people of Hook. This is his chalice, still in daily use in the nearby parish of Rams Grange. During my research on this story, I learned much about the supernatural, about history, and about a much abused girl who lived more than 200 years ago. Was it really possible she had courted the devil? The Rosminian nuns who lived here believe the incident was valid. And one thing beyond anything else makes all the different layers hang together. A right common to all religions, exorcism. It is difficult to have a priest perform an exorcism. Not every priest is considered suitable. It can cause great strain for the priest concerned. And if the exorcism fails, the manifestation can become even stronger. Good versus evil, a war as old as time itself, and a great battle took place here. There are many first-hand accounts of hauntings that were commonplace at the hall. In 1858, some 80 years after Anne's death, Reverend Charles Dale had been engaged by the Loftus family as a tutor to their children, described as a solid, steady, highly educated, unromantic English clergyman. For sleeping quarters, Reverend Dale was given the tapestry room. His first night proved a sleepless one as his bedroom door continuously opened. He continuously closed it. On the second night, Reverend Dale had a visitor. Locking his door on the third night, Reverend Dale still felt nervous. After just three nights at Loftus Hall, Charles Dale resigned from his post and returned to his native England.
many visitors encountered Anne Tottenham's ghostly apparition. A young gentleman arriving with a shooting party during the 1860s wasn't even aware he had seen a ghost. A beautiful young thing entered my room. Having indulged myself earlier, not wisely, but alas, too well, my senses were somewhat diminished, and I soon lapsed into a death-like sleep before I could corner this temptress. <laughs> The next day, I shot four deer and left the chaps to their own devices. reach the heart, but symbols reach the soul. The esoteric language of symbolism is as abstract as its ancientness, and Loftus Hall has many protective symbols woven into its architecture. The house faces east to one of the resurrection of Christ. It uses the Kabbalistic interpretation of the number nine in the front facade. Three rows of nine windows symbolize the eternal God, a reversal of the triple six symbol for evil of the beast. The famous stairway floor is festooned with cruciform shapes. The stairway itself has an ascending central aisle, branching left and right, ensuring the most potent symbol against evil is always present, the crucifix. What really happened here? An exorcism certainly took place, and it wasn't an exorcism of a minor nature. Canon Ling's letter tells us Father Brodus had to use every known exorcism of the church, and that after this, the ghostly activities were confined to one room, the tapestry room. The tapestry room today still manages to evoke a certain awkwardness, and is still the least used room in the house. Who or what was exercised? Could it have been a poltergeist? Poltergeists, unlike ghosts, haunt by causing commotions, by making noises, and by throwing things around. The word poltergeist is derived from two German words. A folklore term, polter, meaning noise, and the word for spirit, geist. The development of psychical research and parapsychology over the last hundred years or so has introduced into the language a more cumbersome phrase to describe the same phenomena. RSPK, Recurrent Spontaneous Psychokinesis. Such disturbances have been recorded since at least the 12th century. At one time, they were believed to have been caused by an evil force, a creature of Satan. But the identity of this force remained a mystery. It's quite likely the identity of the strange visitor to Loftus Hall will also remain a mystery. In 1917, Loftus Hall was sold. An order of Benedictine nuns came to stay, but it was a short stay. The reason for their hurried departure is still unknown. Soon after the Benedictines' hasty retreat, the Rosminian sisters moved into the mansion. They opened a school for young girls interested in joining the order. The school proved quite successful for more than 40 years. Few remnants remain now to remind visitors of the once turbulent times Loftus Hall underwent. Perhaps over 50 years of prayer has dissipated whatever malevolence once dwelt here. Down through the years, almost every aspect of the Loftus Hall story has been examined by the skeptics. All kinds of theories have been bandied about, from the natural to the scientific. Some people believe the stranger had a genuine deformity known as telepes or club foot. Anne had seen this deformity in the flickering firelight. 
At the same time, an unusual phenomenon occurred and helped to complete the illusion, ball lightning, now accepted though far from understood by scientists and meteorologists alike. The lifetime of a single bolt of ball lightning can be measured in seconds. Its disappearance may be silent and harmless or explosively destructive. But the explanation relies a lot on coincidence. Another theory suggests the stranger was a king's messenger. He quickly formed a liaison with Anne, and what should have taken months happened overnight. It's possible Sir Charles discovered the lovers alone together. The outcome was a furious row. The stranger was sent on his way, or more likely challenged to a duel which he lost. As for Anne, it's possible that she witnessed her lover's death and became insane. With time, Anne was found to be pregnant. Perhaps she recovered long enough to give birth. The baby may have died or was taken away from her. And Anne's insanity prompted Sir Charles to invent the demon's story as a cover-up. This, of course, is complete conjecture. However, during the 1870s, when the house was being rebuilt, a skeleton was discovered bricked into the wall of the tapestry room. It's not reported whether the bones were that of an adult or a child. Only the house knows when and how they came to be there. If one accepts any of the explanations and combines it with the probability Anne had suffered terrible mental anguish leading to insanity, the truth begins to emerge. As Anne's family became more embarrassed about her depraved state, they invented some odd stories about her life and death. For evil to prosper, it is only necessary for good men to remain silent. The words of Edmund Burke still reflect the human dilemma. Perhaps Anne's degenerating mind was her prison. If so, the bars of her cell were forged by people who did nothing to help her. If the victim was Anne Tottenham, then the hero must be Father Thomas Brodus. He performed an exorcism. And in a sense, he bridged a gap, not just the obvious one of banishing the manifestation from the hall. No. These were penal times. Catholic priests were hunted by the crown. At worst, they could be killed. At best, they were tolerated, and only just tolerated by the nobility of the day. Yet, after Father Tom's exhortion, the Loftus family endeared him to themselves. He won great concessions for his own parishioners from the barons of Eli. Later on, they would pay for the education of a nephew of Father Tom's to the priesthood. On Father Tom's death, a row ensued between the Loftus and Tottenham families on one side and Father Tom's people on the other. The argument as to where his final resting place should be, in the end, it was a compromise. This is a half Catholic, half Protestant cemetery. This is Father Tom's grave. As he united people in life, so also did he do so in death.
query.